everybody. It's wonderful to see all of you here again. I saw a few of you earlier today, which was wonderful, and it's, uh, and it's just terrific to welcome you. It's actually an incredibly distinct pleasure to offer a really warm welcome um, to all of you who are here to celebrate 50 plus years of co-education at Williams College and to honor you, the women of Williams. So please give yourself a round of applause. I'm so grateful to all of you, whether you're here as a panelist or a participant in any number of the many wonderful sessions that are taking place uh, tomorrow, or whether you journeyed back here alone or met up with a college roommate, your presence here really means so much uh, to all of us. I hope it, the weekend will be part critical reflection, part discovery, and part celebration for everybody here. Last year, with the celebration of the class of 1971's postponed 50th reunion and the class of 1972's 50th reunion, we recognized, yes, yay, <laughs> very nice. We recognized the important early milestones in the college's history of co-education. And this weekend, uh, we have the opportunity to honor that legacy. So in the spring of 1971, seven women walked across the Williams commencement stage to receive diplomas for the first time in the college's history. And in the fall of 1971, the first four-year class of women and men arrived on the campus. The class of 1972 subsequently graduated 44 women who had transferred into the college, and there were many more who spent extensive time here as exchange students. These early women, these early women of Williams were pathbreakers. On behalf of all who followed, we thank you. By expanding access to women and others who had not historically been included at Williams College, the college doubled down on its commitment to educating those who would go into the world to make a difference. As a result, our impact is broader and deeper. This is something Jack Sawyer understood and moved to do in pursuing co-education. Early efforts to diversify the student body evolved into important and sometimes challenging efforts to ensure women felt the same sense of belonging at Williams. We really continue to this day to strive to be an inclusive learning community in which all can thrive. This essential work is ongoing. It does often remain quite challenging. Nevertheless, we persist. I hope when you depart on Sunday, you will leave having reunited with longtime classmates, perhaps even a few faculty, having made new friends and acquired new knowledge and insights and enthusiasm for the role that each of you plays in our Williams community as well as in our larger society. I hope you're gonna leave feeling proud, a part of this wonderfully vibrant and enriching community, and above all, I hope you will experience joy while you're here. We have a lot in store for you, uh, and uh, we begin now formally with the opening keynote with Kristen Anderson Lopez, class of 1994. So if you have children or grandchildren, or have ever been around a child, or even to television for that matter, you are most likely familiar with Kristen's spectacular work. She is the lyrical goddess and award-winning songwriter behind Disney's Frozen and Frozen 2, as well as Frozen on Broadway and Remember Me from Pixar's Coco, earning her both Oscar and Grammy recognition, as well as the hearts and minds of young people everywhere. Truly, I can't let it go. Let it go, let it, sorry. Without stating the cultural phenomenon that is Kristen's body of work. And you heard it here at the opening evening of the Will Women of Williams Conference. Kristen and her husband, Bobby Lopez, who is also here with us this evening, will soon be working on Frozen 3. So exciting. <laughs> A double major in theater and psychology while at Williams, Kristen instills in her frozen protagonists, both of them female, rich inner lives, hard at work reconciling their own personal narratives and desires. 
fitting theme for tonight's program. And of course, only a former E-flat who endured four Williamstown winters could write that the cold didn't bother her anyway. <laughs> In addition to her renowned work with animated film, Kristen's also a co-writer on the Marvel show WandaVision, which, heard an, which earned an Emmy Award for Kristen and Bobby. In Transit, the first ever all a cappella musical on Broadway, I'm seeing a bit of a link there. <laughs> Finding Nemo the Musical, Disney's Winnie the Pooh, and many other projects, including a current streaming series on Hulu called Up Here, a musical romantic comedy. Kristen is as humble as she is talented, so I suspect she's ready for me to wrap up the accolades and turn things over to her. So with that, please join me in giving Kristen a warm Williams welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that lovely intro. <sighs> I am so honored and humbled to be here with you, the women of Williams. If you want to know just how humbled, I'm going to share what is going on in my head right now. I'm thinking of the first time I stood on this stage back in the fall of 91, before it was all Scandinavian, clean, swooping lines. <laughs> no, this is back when it was dusty and haunted. <laughs> I was part of a Brechtian political musical called Oh, What a Lovely War, which featured popular British songs from World War I. <laughs> now that was a fashion choice. <laughs> My big solo in the show was called Sister Susie. It was a tongue twister that got faster and faster as it went. I will sing it for you now, exactly as I did then. Bobby. Sister Susie sewing shirts for soldiers Such skillet sewing shirts my shy young sister Susie shows Some soldiers send epistles say they'd sooner sleep on thistles Than the saucy soft short shirts for soldiers Sister Susie sews Sister, sister Susie sewing shirts for soldiers Such skillet sewing shirts my shy young sister Susie shows Some soldiers send epistles say they'd sooner sleep on thistles Than the saucy soft short shirts for soldiers Sister Susie sews and it went on, and it went on, and it went <laughs> Now, I noticed that show after show, members of the cast would gather in the wings to watch me. Finally, closing night, one of the scary senior theater majors cornered me at a cast party and asked me, I notice you make this move. What do you think epistles means? <laughs> I don't know, um, like a soldier who delivers a message? I hadn't really thought about it. I was new to Williams. I was so busy worrying about fitting in and seeming cool. Consulting a dictionary had not been a priority. <laughs> what was a priority was slaying with my cool move. <laughs> but senior Jeff looked at me with his ice blue eyes and enlightened me, saying, an epistle is a letter. Fully mortifying. <laughs> of course, epistolary novels, the Pauline epistles. Why hadn't I seen it? Luckily, stories can change. <laughs> so yes, President Mandel can introduce me and mention accolades and shiny statues that live on a shelf in our office. They wear sweaters. Um, <laughs> But know with every fiber in your being that I'm speaking to you from a much more familiar place tonight. The part of me that always feels a little bit like the epistle girl, making mistakes and learning from them. The part of me that is a very flawed, messy AF protagonist in a story that is constantly being rewritten. And our lives are made up of millions of these stories. Some of them sing. Some of them sting, and some of them beg for a serious rewrite. In this time with you tonight, I am going to share with you what I know about creating narrative, and especially rewriting it. 
Uh, and some of the techniques and experiences I've encountered professionally can actually apply to our personal lives and even help us shape the world around us. By the way, this is my amazing husband, Robert Lopez, here at the piano. He very generously agreed to be my accompanist tonight, and I think he's enjoying the fresh experience that I'm the one sweating in the spotlight, and he just gets to kick back and play over there. <laughs> one other piece of business. Language is important. I learned that at Williams. Um, when I use the word female or woman, which I will a lot in this talk, this is inclusive of any human who identifies as female. Also, the historical statistics I'm going to use today are really looking through a binary gender lens. Though newer statistics are beginning to look at a more inclusive, gender-fluid way, I won't be using many of those tonight. And while I'm going to speak from my own experience as a woman, my overall message applies to anyone who has not had a cis male experience. Anyway, my husband and I do a lot of panels. And in, in, in all of our interviews, in all our panels, there are two questions we are always asked. How do you work together and stay married? Which I'm not going to answer tonight, because that's a whole book and maybe a podcast in itself. Um, <laughs> here's the second question they always ask us. Which comes first, music or lyrics? And our answer is always the same. It's always story. Before we write a single song for any project, animated, TV, even theater, we can spend years in a room collaborating with directors, playwrights, animators, creating characters, shaping their two or three act arcs. We don't get scripts that have the songs already laid out. We build those scripts and we hunt for the fundamental architecture of the musical together. And people are really surprised that on every project, we spend probably 90% of the bulk of our time on story, and 10% is actually on writing the songs, recording, and producing them. So I think about narrative and story a lot. And over the last two decades, I've learned that in order to get to the good ones and make fresh ones, you have to do three things. Step one, you have got to get a draft out so you can look at it. Step two, you have to break that story apart. You've got to examine the pieces, you've got to ask questions, keep the best parts, and be willing to throw out what's not working. And then step three, we retain the good parts, and we rebuild the story back stronger, and we do that again and again until we run out of time and it's pencils down. <laughs> I, uh, so John Lasseter, I want to paint a clearer picture of this process, and first I want to grab some water because I talk a lot during this talk. Mm. So John Lasseter and the legendary brain trust of writers and directors at Pixar in the 80s and the 90s had codified a process of developing a story that John later brought down to Disney and they still use today. And I was very lucky and got to experience this process in action both at Pixar and Disney. Every 12 weeks, the creative team of a project creates a new version of the story we are trying to tell. We use these huge beat boards that look like that, which become scripts. And then we execute that script through storyboards with scratch vocals and with animatics that look like this. <laughs> with these primitive tools, we do a screening for the bulk of the company and a small group of fellow artists, the writers, the directors, and the heads of story all working on films in development, and we call them the brain trust, come to see it as well. Immediately after, uh, we do a two to three day note session before we all get up, dust ourselves off, and start building the next version. When I describe this to friends, I like to have them imagine a giant gymnasium and imagine the writers, directors, and composers all building a huge Lego city piece by excruciating piece for three months. Then, after three months, we open the door and we share this creation with 100 people who also build Lego cities. And then we all go have a lovely catered lunch. Then afterwards, everybody comes back with a big baseball bat and they smash everything that doesn't work. Buildings collapse, entire Lego villages just fall to pieces on the floor. Or in my case, our case, songs. Sometimes all that's left are three or four little perfect elements a firehouse, a tree, somebody's little hat. 
And those are the elements you use and you bring to the next gymnasium and you start building your next Lego city. It's not for the weak. It can be heartbreaking. It can be temporarily paralyzing, yes, but it's also protective. It's a way of supporting and strengthening our work with multiple iterations before it has to go and stand on its own in the world. And at its best, it's collaborative, it's fun. And there are so many times that I look around in that process and think, how lucky I am to do this for a living. But the truth is, I really wouldn't have a seat at that table. I wouldn't be in the proverbial room where it happens if I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking and wrestling with my own narrative and the narrative that I have observed in the world around who gets to tell stories. Let us travel for a moment to the 80s. No, 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 not those 80s. My 80s. Thank you, thank you. I'm eight years old. It's 1980, and I am obsessed with all things theater. I listen daily to my collection of Broadway cast albums. For every birthday and holiday, oh my god, is my fly open? It is! Oh my god! <laughs> Remember, remember how we talked about rewriting narratives? We're just gonna, whew. All right. <laughs> that was my eight-year-old me right then. Okay. For every birthday and holiday, I ask for tickets to a Broadway show. I'm obsessed with musical theater. Okay. So it's 80s, and this is before they invented helicopter parenting and overscheduling. And most weekends and most of the summer, it's just me and a bunch of kids from the neighborhood hanging out and looking for something to do. I have my own rep company, basically. So I would write plays and direct them and design them and star in them. Captain and Tennille's muskrat love might have been dramatized on my patio more than a few times. Admission was always free. Uh, in fourth grade, my mom takes me to see a community theater of My Fair Lady. I come home and I immediately write my own 15-page adaptation from memory. It heavily features the word dingaling. <laughs> but nonetheless, my fourth grade teacher becomes my first producer and allows me to cast it and direct it and put it on for our entire school. This is what I was doing in my free time for fun. And yet somewhere, by the time I was in middle school, the narrative morphed into Kristen loves theater, so her dream is to be a Broadway actress. It could have been from me, or it could have been what I observed. Here are a few statistics to give that evolution some historical perspective. Uh, I have to give a big shout out to my assistant, my amazing assistant, Tavia, who is a um, Swati, she's a Swarthmore, sorry, Swarthmore alum, and when she dug these up, I got a sub, or the subject uh, in the email said, stats, these are horribly depressing. <laughs> in 1914, 8% of musicals were written by women, 8% by male-female teams, and all the rest were male. In 1980, it had actually gone down a point. 7% by women and 7% by male-female teams. 86% were written by men. W-T-F. <laughs> women musical writers were a rare, strange thing, and I must have absorbed that narrative because I really doubled down on the actress thing. Uh, so much so that when a palm reader at a friend's bat mitzvah told me that I would be a songwriter, I was insulted and annoyed. <laughs> I had seen glamorous female actresses on TV winning Tonys and Oscars, but songwriters, they were those grizzled, harried men hunched around a piano in the corner of the cast albums. Songwriters wore itchy turtlenecks and smoked and drank a lot of scotch. <laughs> I was going to be a serious actress like Miss Patti LuPone or Miss Meryl Streep or Miss Piggy. <laughs> Skip to Williams, where I majored in theater and psychology. I sang with the E flats. I did the theater shows. And aside from one mortifying semantic mishap, only less mortifying than starting my speech with my fly down just now, <laughs> I loved every second of it. <laughs> 
Winter of my junior year, Jason Howland, class of 93, now a Broadway composer and music supervisor, currently up for a Tony himself for orchestration. Yay, Jason. Uh, he asked me to collaborate and direct an original musical that he wrote. I was honored. I was excited. The opportunity felt electric, but like, the kind of electric that's like a live wire in a wet street. <laughs> it was too scary. I had no examples or, of peers or role models in that kind of creative leadership role. How dare I think that I could take on that responsibility and command that kind of artistic respect at age 20? I made the safe choice, and I performed in the Shakespeare play that spring. I graduated, and I moved to New York. I auditioned and lived the highly unglamorous life of a solid but not stellar musical theater actress. I played a lot of nuns in New Hampshire, you guys. <laughs> I tempted for investment banks the other 47 weeks of the year. One day, the bankers started to become younger than me, and it was then that I said, something's not right here, and finally took inventory of my situation. I put my story out there, and I looked at it. I love musical theater, I like singing, but I don't like temping, I hate auditioning, and even when I get a part, I don't love doing the same show eight times a week. I get bored and I rewrite the lyrics backstage. <laughs> the narrative sucked. I was in bad need of a rewrite. Now, I promised Lila and the planning committee of Women at Williams that I was going to sing. So I'm going to sing a little bit of a song that we wrote inspired by that 20-something crisis in my life. Maud mentioned that we have a streaming show called Up Here that just came out on Hulu in March. 25 songs are available on Spotify now. Uh, <laughs> this one is in the first episode, and in it, it takes place in 1999, by the way. In it, the female protagonist looks at her small, safe, playing-by-the-rules life, and she takes inventory. I'm going to drink some water while you play the intro. <clears throat> These smiley face pajamas and this rainbow kitten mug have got to go. Why don't I throw them both away? They're comfy, but they chain me to this anvil of a couch in a defensive crouch, afraid to go and play. I know the rules, be sunny, honey, close those knees. Clorox, uh, Clorox offensive thoughts and you'll prevent disease. It's like a show where every song's the same reprise. Oh. But breaking out is dangerous. I know the party game, be small and tame. Or they will maim you in your sleep. So buy the fuzzy pencils, wear the t-shirts with the hearts. Let any darts or weapons sink into the deep. And find the boy, the six or seven out of 10, who cracks a joke you laugh at every now and then. You know you'll fall in love, although you wonder when. Oh, what if I try to change this ever-looping tune? What if I let them see the dark side of my moon? My brain is like a video store with a big restricted section door with lots of cool stuff hiding in the ultraviolet light. What if I let somebody see me tonight? I could be that girl from anthro class who felt no shame or guilt and wore the kilt with the fishnets and the fans. I remember what she said that time she passed me in the quad Your Diet Coke is oppression in a can She thought she sized me up in a single glance She never noticed me in Afro-Cuban dance She never think I'd go and buy some plastic pants No What if I cut the tags and took them for a spin? What if 
contracting yeast infections in time to let the bridges burn so many lessons to unlearn what if i let somebody see me if they saw what it is to be me would they be terrified by the sight what if we see about what if tonight? <laughs> what if indeed? I took a baseball bat at age 27 and smashed my Legos, keeping only what I knew was true. I love musical theater, I love singing, and I asked, what if I tried writing? And I started my way, bit by skittish bit, back to my nine-year-old creative self. Very soon after, I found out about this amazing program called the BMI Musical Theater Writing Workshop, which is basically a free three-year songwriting grad program for those who audition and get in. The first song I ever presented was like one of those Oprah aha moments. The sky opened and it was like, this, this is what you're supposed to do. And three weeks later, I met my husband, who's also in the workshop. And for me, it was one-stop shopping for a life. <laughs> I share this story to demonstrate what a struggle it was to figure out my real narrative and my real place in the creative world. I had to get really uncomfortable, miserable enough that I was forced to take my story apart and really look at it and ask questions. It was then that I realized that one of my fundamental assumptions, what I thought was my lifelong dream of being a Broadway star, was actually a faulting building, faulty building block. It was close, but it needed a rewrite. That's the thing about some of these problematic narratives in our lives. Sometimes they involve an insidious wrong turn, a hidden blind assumption, like deciding one day during a dance rehearsal that an epistle is a soldier that stands like this, <laughs> and not a letter best dramatized like this. <laughs> I wish I could tell you that once I discovered I was a writer, that I was immediately whisked to the front row of my first original Broadway musical. But I had just stepped into a bigger narrative that would need to be reckoned with. Here are the numbers by gender for Broadway in 1999, the year I joined BMI. Now, there were four, four women who got to write original, the books of original musicals. Zero musicals had a female composer of all the shows on Broadway. Only one musical had a female lyricist, and that was Betty Comden, who had written Peter Pan, and it was a revival of that. And of the 17 plays that were presented on Broadway, zero were written by a female playwright. So yes, in those early aughts, doors opened. My work made it into festivals, I received some prizes, I got into some coveted fellowship programs, and even made a couple of bucks writing theater for young audiences. And my experience tracks with the current gender statistics now. Fellowships, grad programs, and awards are close to 50-50 for gender representation. If you can look, I'm gonna drink some water, take a look at those. Um, <laughs> but then and now, it's the jump to getting commercially produced where the gender parity divides. So toggling back to my story in the mid-late 2000s, I would watch my male colleagues, including my very talented boyfriend at the time, have off-Broadway and Broadway producers take bets on them as my female colleagues and I continued to have projects mired in developmental limbo. We always seemed to hear that we needed another workshop or get offered another non-paid reading. And we frustrated women, we began to talk. Marsha Norman, a Pulitzer Prize winner and the head of the playwriting program at Juilliard, noticed the far too obvious disparity between what happened to her male students and her female students. And she, Teresa Rebeck and Julia Jordan, and all wonderful playwrights, decided to do something about it and formed an organization called The Lilies after the groundbreaking playwright Lillian Hellman, who famously wrote, you need to write like the devil and act like one when necessary. They started to look at the story 
and ask what if. They saw that females were notoriously overlooked or snubbed by the traditional awards with predominantly male nominating committees. And the Lilies asked, what if we throw our own celebration to acknowledge the work of women in our industry? Though started as an awards night, this convergence was powerful. The palpable anger at the obvious gender, racial, and intersectional inequities we were all witnessing in our industry became a call to action. We asked ourselves, what if we could meaningfully and intentionally do whatever is necessary to support women writers, directors, designers, and performers, especially those of color? The Lilly founders were all writers, and instinctually, they knew they needed to find a way to see the full story so they could see what needed to be rewritten. They collaborated with the Dramatist Guild to analyze three years of data across all American theater and discovered that in 2011, only 20.3% of all American theater involved a female creator. This is all American theater. To quote the report on that first count, if the world worked like that, it would mean that four out of every five things you heard in the world would be said by men. Having that story laid out, the Lilies were able to ask questions and wonder about the smaller narratives within the narrative. There's so much data I would really love to share, and it can all be found at thelilies.org. I'm on the board for both the Lilies and the Dramatist Guild, by the way, and happy to get into methodology over cocktails. Um, but through all these studies, the Lilies were able to shine a light on some of the more problem areas inside the story and identify some parts of those Lego cities that needed smashing and rebuilding. They identified that lack of childcare plays a huge part in stopping the momentum of a female playwright and composer just as they're getting their first significant production. And they wondered, what if we were able to provide childcare at regional theaters, festivals, and residencies? And this has led to a policy change almost all across the country. They identified that we have an issue with the bulk of theater critics being still predominantly white and male. And they wondered, what if there was a different way to think about theatrical criticism? They've even come up with an alternative called Three Views. It's yet to be executed, but it's a web platform that would provide three points of view with diverse, artist-driven, critical content. They identified a statistically significant bias for producers and artistic directors to take a chance on male creators' potential while needing a female creator to have a proven track record. Though a depressing finding, yeah, what a relief it was for so many female artists to know we weren't whining, we weren't crazy. The power of the count lifted us out of our individual experiences and allowed us to come together to educate an entire industry about the role unconscious bias plays in perpetuating gender and racial inequities in all aspects around programming, around casting, and around producing live theater. Just a few years later, Count 2.0 measured an 8% uptick. Um, the pandemic, I'd love to show you new, new numbers, but the pandemic has caused some disruption. And I, I, but I feel optimistic that we're doing the work and things are getting better. Uh, this is the power of women coming together and telling their stories. We start seeing patterns and we start asking the important what ifs. Meanwhile, in 2011, in a small conference room in Burbank, I was unknowingly experiencing the transformative power of women in a room myself. Through a series of jobs at the Disney Company, I had somehow landed in a prime spot at a prime table. And they also put Jennifer Lee, who had just proven herself by writing Wreck-It Ralph, at that table as well. Now, Frozen was made in collaboration with dozens of incredibly talented women and men. But in the end, it had to be written by four people. Chris Buck, the director, Bobby, me, and Jen, who came on as screenwriter and was soon promoted to co-director. What was new was that two of us were women, and for the first time in forever, we had loud and equal voices at the table. So when Anna, the protagonist, wasn't quite working, and the Lego pieces were all on the floor, we would tell our own stories about how upsetting it could be to feel shut out from a friend and how dorky or awkward we would feel around really cute guys when we were in high school. 
We both had sisters. We knew what a slam door felt like. We were raising little girls of our own. My dad wants me to tell you that we also put both of our little girls in the movie. Um, <laughs> anyway, when we went to write, we infused all that experience into the words and music. When Jen, Bobby, and I first joined the team, there was a draft where Elsa was an angry, bitter outcast. The old trope, uh, the old trope of the powerful woman as villain witch. As we imagined Elsa, reimagined Elsa completely, Jen and I would share our stories of how scary and isolating it can be to be the only female in a position of power. And when the pieces of the story were on the floor, we were able to ask different what ifs. What if she isn't evil? What if she's wounded or paralyzed by expectation of perfection placed on her shoulders? I asked Bobby what he thought was the biggest impact of having two female creatives on the story, and he reminded me that every screening cycle, as we were trying to fix big plot problems, a predominantly male room would always suggest, like 107 times, they would suggest that the sisters should hate each other because they're both in love with Hans. And Jen and I, we were adamant that the sister split had to go deeper than that. And we all know, fighting over a man is a symptom of a wound, not the cause of it. We wondered, what if they were both wounded and both looking to heal something that had nothing to do with a man and everything to do with something that had happened in their childhood? And the what ifs led to more what ifs, and this led to ultimately changing the entire DNA of the movie. A few years back, we got a binder of market research on why people are still watching and buying Frozen merchandise. In every case, the fans pointed to the fact that Frozen was a different case, different take on the princess narrative. And that brings us to this weekend. This weekend is all about listening to different narratives, to witness stories laid out before us. We're going to look at narratives around who gets to sit behind judicial benches, Whose art hangs on the museum walls? And what the hell do we do with these changing female bodies? We'll be looking at our personal stories. How do we negotiate our salaries? What's my sequel? How do we bounce back from burnout? I really want to go to that one, but I am so burned out, I'm not sure I'm going to make it there. <laughs> As women of Williams, just by being here, we'll be rewriting our own stories of our relationship with the college. What a wonderful way to get perspective on where we are by coming to this place that so powerfully shaped us then. It's a prime moment to look for the what ifs in our lives. The what ifs we didn't think to look for or that we haven't seen or maybe, and, and these are the hardest, the ones we can't unsee but we try to ignore. Because yes, disruption is hard. Rewrites and change are hard. But look around us. Look around us. We are surrounded by the ultimate female brain trust. What power is in this room? What wisdom? What imagination? What belonging we're going to find here? And we're all going to bring our current messy drafts with our flies down. <laughs> <laughs> Personal, professional, spiritual to this moment together. We'll talk, maybe we'll cry. We can lay out our drafts for one another. This is a powerful convergence. Someone might ask that just right what if that makes us see a hidden assumption or a way forward that we couldn't see. We may get that synchronous piece of information, that connection that helps us take action where we were stuck. And as for the global narratives, I'm talking the big, unwieldy ones, like climate change, reproductive rights, the dream of seeing a female president elected in our lifetime. <sighs> I believe that when we come together to share and strengthen one another's stories, we can all go back out into the world ready to face the most entrenched, intractable stories in our culture, armed with new tools, new energy, new what-ifs. And so I launch us into this weekend with a snippet of a song from a character some of you may know. I promise singing. 
if you can, forget about the lunch boxes and the dresses and the cereals and the string cheese. <laughs> Before all that, she was written as a character who had been stuck in a narrative of isolation and shame. Fleeing the wreckage of a story she has left behind, she discovers in this liminal moment that there is space for a new, more powerful story to emerge. Feel free to sing along, <laughs> and I mean it. <laughs> I'm going to take a sip of water because I've been talking for 30 minutes. Ready? <clears throat> My power flurries through the air into the ground. My soul is spiraling in frozen fractals all around. And one thought crystallizes like an icy blast. I'm never going back. The past is in the past. Let it go, let it go. And I'll rise like the break of dawn Let it go, let it go That perfect girl is gone Here I stand In the light of day Let the storm rage on The cold never bothered me anyway. And that is my epistle. <laughs> Thank you.